no secret that at SCT, we're big fans of the Land Cruiser. It's a legend in itself, and it's been a great tow car for a number of years. Many of you have seen the build video on our 200 series. But how is the 300 series gonna stack up in regards to that? Make sure you like, subscribe, follow all of our other videos, and comment down below so we can see what you think about it. But let's go and tackle this brand new Land Cruiser. So the 300 series Land Cruiser arrived in Australia only a very, very, very short time ago. There's only a handful of models available, all of them owned by Toyota. And when Toyota said, how's this go compared to your 200 series? Um, here are the keys, test it out. We went, you beauty, let's have a crack. So what we've done is we've brought with us an Iridium 15 camp hybrid camper trailer. We've got the GXL spec trim of the 300 series. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do a tow test and we're gonna compare the 300 series with the 200, with the, uh, 200 series. We're gonna take it to the workshop and check out all over it and go over it in terms of the uh, modability, if that's a word, because uh, it's no secret that we uh, we do a fair bit of work with our car to make sure it's absolutely matched to, the, to how we're gonna use it. So how's the 300 series gonna stack up in that regards? Um, we're gonna also let the workshop boys have a look over it and get their opinion. Uh, we're gonna attend to some of the questions that you guys have asked on Instagram and Facebook about what you wanna know about the 300 series. So there's been a stack of questions that have come in um, and we're just gonna have some fun with it. In the end, we're not a car reviewer. We're a, we're a real user of the product. Um, and so that's sort of the impression and that's sort of the, uh, the, the look that we wanna, um, you know, that's the look that we wanna check out in this new 300 series. First off the bat, how's this thing look? Well. On the whole, it's obviously a, um, an evolution of the original model. So they've kept the big front end, they've gone a massive grill, this being the GXL uh, trim, it's got a sort of a black, um, sort of black highlights uh, to it, I've thrown a little nudge bar on this. Um, uh, and as a whole, it looks all right. Um, I think it'll grow on us. But what's here really interesting about, uh, about this model is they've actually used a, a combination of steel and aluminium in terms of the body panels. So they've, they've lost a heap of weight in it. Um, as part of losing the weight in it, they've also obviously changed the engine up. They've changed, uh, changed wheel sizes. They've done a complete update of the interior, which we'll have a look at, um, and changed uh, a few little things which we're not overly impressed with. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna address the elephant in the room. What the hell have they done with the rear tailgate? So we've seen the front. Have a look at the back again just an evolution in the design looks pretty good um you know it's got uh it's got in terms of storage it's got um it's got heaps of storage inside the oh. it's got heaps of storage inside the back of it um it's got rear seats that fold up it's got cup holders um this has got a big rubber mat which will come in very very handy um but it's missing something. Um, oh yeah, a proper rear tailgate. What have you done, Toyota? So Toyota have maintained the three and a half ton towing capability. Uh, it's also got 350 kilo uh, rated tow ball mass. All of those figures are dependent on how you actually load the car. So if you've got a massive amount of weight in the back of the car, then that's going to impact on your maximum towing capacity. But overall, the car is actually lighter. So how that performs and how that affects things, um, well, we'll find out, I guess. And then obviously down this side, We've got more tires and wheels there on the other side as well but anyway what's funny is you can actually hear the uh the different sound of the body panel so if you uh tap that there's a steel body panel and there's your aluminium body panel so obviously the bolt-on sections are uh, aluminium um saves weight um then you've obviously got your side steps which more than likely if you're going to be doing any sort of serious off-roading you're going to get rid of them and put some uh, good quality steps or sliders on uh, you got your roof rails, which Toyota put some racks on there, um, and wheels and tires. So we're actually going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but these are 265, 18-inch wheels. Um, so the old 200 series were a 6.5, depending on whether you had 17 or 18, so diameter hasn't actually changed. What has changed is they've gone from a 285 to a 265. That means they're skinnier. So that's gonna be a big one for the four drivers and off-roaders that wanna go with bigger, uh, uh, bigger wheels and tires. So when we get it into the workshop, we'll grab, some, um, we'll grab some bigger wheels and tires and see the fitment and see whether we can, one, get wider uh, wheels, and, wheels and tires on, and two, whether we can actually get 17s on, which will be a big one over these brat culpers. So that'll be cool to see. Otherwise, yeah, overall evolution uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the car. Looks pretty good. Um, let us know in the comments below what you think of the new look of the 300 series.
down to uh, down to the water, um, and we thought we'd give you a quick run through of the interior of this car. So we're taking it nice and easy because it's a pretty windy road. And one thing I've got to say that I'm pretty impressed with this car is the actual turning circle. Um, much better than uh, well, it feels a lot better than the 200 series. We've had some pretty tight switchbacks on um, on this road, and yeah, it just turns no problem when we we're manoeuvring around last night to hook the trailer up. Um, again, just the, the turning circle is yeah, a market improvement. Right, so we've been out for a couple of hours. We've just gotten back to the workshop. Let's go and have a look inside. Do a quick run through inside before we throw it up on the hoist. So come on over. Let's have a let's have a squeeze. So as mentioned, this is the GXL model. So it's not the bottom, which is the GX. It's the one up from the bottom, but it's still just under 110 grand. So you'd expect a bit of luxury and a bit of a uh, few features in it. So what have we got? Well, it's definitely more car like. Um, I really like the black roof. Uh, it sort of darkens it up and sort of doesn't make it claustrophobic, but it definitely feels more, um, a bit more sort of luxury and complete. Um, we've got a big infotainment screen up here. Um, you've got your controls for your uh, climate control. So you turn your air conditioning uh, on and off up here. Couple of big vents. You've got your stop start button all up here. Um, down here is a lot of your driving modes, which is a pretty handy spot to have it because it means that you can sort of keep control of uh, the, the obviously the gear stick if you're doing a lot of off-roading and you're moving it from between gears. You've got your drive modes, um, mode selection. When you're not full driving, you can adjust it between eco mode, normal mode, and uh, sports mode. Um, you got your MTS, which is your uh, basically Toyota's uh, traction control system for, for terrain, multi-terrain response type system. Uh, DAC, which is downhill assist. Um, you've then got uh, your center diff lock, um, your turn assist, high low range, uh, electric park brake, which is a big change from for uh, Land Cruisers, is to go to an electric um, park brake. Anybody that's ever had a Land Cruiser will know that uh, handbrakes are just non-existent. Uh, you've got a hill hold. You've got wireless charging, which is great. Um, you've then got uh, charging, USB charging ports, um, nice gears to it, big cup holders. Uh, and then you've got your center console, which opens up both ways and from the back, um, but more on that later. Steering wheel, uh, just your standard controls. There's nothing special about that. Uh, you've got a, a little LED or LCD screen, I should say, in the center there, which shows you obviously what doors are open and whatnot. Steering wheel controls. Um, Toyota have kept with the, uh, with the, the with the theory that um, uh, people that are working are gonna be uh, wearing gloves, so all the buttons are big. Um, I saw that years ago in, a, in, in one review and it talked about the fact that buttons are always big in Land Cruisers because if you're wearing gloves, you wanna be able to hit the buttons and all the buttons are a good size, apart from these ones, which are a little bit smaller, but still well operational with, um, with, with gloves on if I was wearing them. Everything's big, it's chunky, it's uh, user-friendly. Um, and yeah, pretty simple. So yeah, grab handle here, Jesus bar, if you call it. Uh, your glove box there, uh, which is a good size. A um, little bit rattly, but let's see how that goes uh, on some corrugations. Um, uh, and you got your reading lights and door lights, SOS button. You got your light for your makeup. Um, otherwise, let's jump in the back, see what the back's like. 
So decent size if you are carrying other people around, um, then you've got good enough space. You've got air conditioning controls in the back here. You've got um, USB-C ports and, um, and SIG charging. Um, what is missing out of this, which um, is only a little thing, but it's a big thing if you're actually living with it, you've got no, no, um, no pockets uh, behind the seats. Where do you put your, your maps or your you know, other bits and pieces that you just like to chuck away in there? We put tire deflation things. That's just weird. Uh, you've got no center armrest um, in here. Uh, again, I understand it's a GXL, but this is still a $110,000 car. Anyway, um, yeah, nothing special about this. And then if we open this up, that pops open and you've got your third row of seat, which in this fold into the floor. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be sitting here for very long. Um, I wouldn't sit here at all. To be honest, cup holders, charging ports, cool, but that's really uncomfortable. I'm out. Yeah. Let's go around the back. And then you've got obviously seat up, which leaves you enough space for your towing kit and your cover. And that's about it. Um, the other seat's down. This has got a rubber mat, which I'm assuming that's enough to an accessory. Pick that because that's cool. Um, that'll work. Um, and you've got underneath here is you've got a little bit of storage uh, so you get a little tool bag which is your standard Toyota tool bag I'm sure that's the same kit that was in the 80 series I don't think they've updated that at all um, you've then got uh, a 100 watt inverter in the cupboard there um, old halogen lights they haven't updated that you'd think you'd go LED by now a couple of tie down points and uh, in here you've sort of just got little hidey holes and whatnot, which we'll look into because in the 200 series, that's where we hide our compressor and you're not gonna get a compressor in there. And finally, you've got your big open tailgate. Now I'm gonna explain why this is the stupidest decision Toyota has ever made. The Toyota, the, the Land Cruiser itself has, has a lot of DNA in it. And a big part of that is the split tailgate. It's something that we looked at when we brought the car. We've always loved Land Cruisers, but when we were looking at our 200 series, uh, we looked at uh, Land Rovers, we looked at patrols, we looked at all sorts of things. And usability was a massive factor in terms of how we use it and what we want to use the car for. This, I hate, I just don't like it at all. Um, I think they've missed out on a massive part of the DNA of the Land Cruiser, the usability, the design and the functionality. If you don't believe me, check out what we've got over here. It's everything. It's our workbench. It's where we make lunch. It's where we set the computers up. It's easy access. You can stand at it. You can sit on it. It's just user friendly. Uh, it's a, been a design cue of the Land Cruiser forever and ever. And in my mind, this, even though you're saving weight and you're probably saving fuel and everything else to lose this part of the Land Cruiser. Yeah, it's a big no, no. So if we were setting this car up as the ultimate tourer, uh, what would we do to it? Well, let's throw it on the hoist. We've been given a stack of questions by everybody on, uh, on YouTube and Instagram and, and Facebook. So we'll throw it on the hoist. Let's grab a, uh, a big wheel out. Let's check um, the drive line, um, fuel capacity, how easy it would be to change the exhaust over. We'll have a look under the bonnet and see if we can get a second battery and how easy it's gonna be to get a snorkel onto it um, and do all those things that uh, all of us that like modifying our cars for, um, for touring and off-road uh, off use are gonna do to it. Let's crack into it. So under the bonnet, we've been hit up by a few questions uh, in here, including, am I gonna be able to fit a snorkel to it? Does it have two air boxes, which was a rumor that started, I believe in Dubai about the twin air box situation. Second battery, where am I gonna be able to put the second battery? Bull bar, um, and then a few other things which are, um, which are obviously related to underneath it. So let's run through how they've actually set up this, the V6 twin turbo uh, Land Cruiser engine. Fluid, all your sort of brake sort of stuff, um, all just protected up underneath that cover. I don't know why, but it's there. You got three fuse boxes, I think. Relays and fuses there, relays and fuses there, and relays and fuses over there. Um, you've then got, obviously, the engine coolant, uh, massive fan, big ass fan in front of your radiator. That's your air intake or your, um, your air box, um, and which runs through into the wheel arch here, which is fairly chunky and fairly wide, and uh, then more fuses and relays in there and your battery actually lives underneath this box, underneath here. Exhibit A. So we can take that out, throw that up there. 
So that's where your battery is. So let's talk second batteries. So this is your primary, uh, this is your primary battery. Um, it's your standard battery that comes with any car. It's got, um, it's got 80 amps and 689 cold cranking amps. So it's nothing special. It's just your standard run of the mill starter battery. Would you put a second battery in here? I think it's important if you're gonna be running a lot of accessories that you would need a second battery. If you're planning on running fridges, lights, a whole lot of other gear in the back of the car, UHF radios, um, you're gonna be running uh, Anderson plugs out to, you know, to camper trailers, all that sort of stuff, um, then power is a massive issue. Second battery, I don't know where you're gonna fit it in. That's gonna take a little bit of uh, umming and ahhing by some of the modification mobs. You may be able to get maybe two slightly smaller or better designed batteries and actually slot two batteries into here. You have got a fair bit of working space in here, which is good, um, but I don't know whether there's in the high spec models, whether there's actually extra things that are all mounted in here to take up that space. If not, it would be a great area to mount your, um, you know, module sensors, relays for your camper trailer, your extra fuse panels for all of your other bits and pieces, your UHF um, and all that sort of stuff. Access wise, all things are fairly easy to get to and easy to work on. Um, let's talk snorkels and airbox. So the 200 series had a dust ingress uh, reputation, um, whether it was deserved um, over the longevity of that car, um, you know, people have obviously had, had issues. So airbox, unfortunately, the design of the new airbox is very, very, very similar to the old one. You've got your four latches, one, two, three, four, um, which lifts up, lifts the airbox up, and then you've got your standard, similarly designed uh, uh, filter. Um, you've got inside the airbox, you've got your little duct uh, gill thing in there, which is for your drainage, but that can also let water in. So as a standard car, would work perfectly fine. It would be a great run around, do dirt roads, no problem whatsoever. If, however, you were gonna be converting it into the ultimate Outback Tourer, I'd be sealing that hole right up and then looking at where you're gonna be running the snorkel, the snorkel, your air, uh, intake comes through here and into uh, this panel here. So your snorkel is obviously going to run up here and up the up the um, window seal there. So no doubt the likes of ARB, TGM, a few of the other um, uh, big aftermarket accessories providers are already looking at the aesthetics of that and the design of that. But uh, that should be a fairly simple installation to get the snorkel into um, into the big 300. Oh, it's on this side. Yeah, yeah. As Aaron pointed out, it's on the opposite side. So. What you're gonna lose is you're gonna lose the big, big suction noise that you get when you put your boot into the, um, into the big 200 series uh, V8. Where well, you can hear that roar, you're not gonna get that on this. Um, but yeah, obviously opposite side. So that's a design change. Let's throw that back in. Have another look around and then we'll pop it up on the hoist. Check out the wheel travel. Going up on the hoist and she's still touching the ground. Credit to Toyota on that one. There we go. Lift off. Underneath it, well, that's a different game. We need to look underneath there. Toyotas have always been really, really strong, or Land Cruisers more specifically, have always had really, really uh, strong um, underpinnings in terms of the design of underneath it. You know that you've got a solid structure. It's basically a truck underneath. Um, and you want to know that they haven't skimped on any of the design or the, um, the parts that actually go into it. So starting from the front, um, you've got a, a tow point there. I don't think Toyota would call it a recovery point, um, but you've got a tow point there, which uh, looks like it's bolted to the front part of the cross beam for the chassis, which is also your radi radiator support um, bracket, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a pretty solid point. Um, you've then got a, a bash plate. So it's, a, um, it's like a carbon or um, carbon fiber or um, I'm assuming it's Kevlar or some sort of composite material um, bash plate. It's solid as, it's definitely an improvement on the standard. Um, if you were doing, however, a lot of uh, heavy duty full driving, you're more than likely gonna be going a, a steel bash plate. But in terms of um, how, what they've done per the previous model, it's an improvement on standard. So uh, another thumbs up for Toyota on that one. Obviously, you can see the level of uh, droop that these tyres, uh, the, the suspension's actually getting. Looking underneath it, it looks like what they've done is they've actually extended the upper control arm. So they've got much longer upper control arms in there. Um, they've also rearranged the geometry. And the actual droop and how it's all designed is, yeah, it's, it's on point. Um, so everything is solid, huge. Um, uh, you obviously got your um, any sway bars. Um, obviously, your, uh, in terms of all your, your steering links, your suspension components, your CV, um, your ball joints, um, they're all easy to get to. 
which means for us as four-wheel drivers, it's easy to repair on the track if you need to, um, but it's also easy to do work on. So if you are the kind of person that's gonna be doing a bit of work at home by yourself, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's easy to access. There's nothing special in there that's gonna create difficult, difficulty in terms of the suspension system. Um, you know, unlike a, a, a um, Defender or a Patrol, which have very unique suspension systems, they've kept with what works, they've just made it better. So yeah, thumbs up to Toyota on that. Lots of little plastic bits and pieces, but that's not uncommon for a new car. You gotta remember that the Toyota designs these for um, your general outback tourer, families that are doing the school run, uh, trips to the shopping mall, uh, and people that are just like enjoy a weekend getaway. So this sort of stuff's not an issue for that. If you're going into modifying heavily, then you're gonna be removing a lot of that anyway when the bull bar goes on. Speaking of bull bars, Toyota have already released their bull bar. The aftermarket accessories haven't released their bull bars. The way that it looks like it all actually works is you actually do, have to do a fair bit of cutting. So you've got to cut the front bumper bar, then it just sits over the grill here, um, but it all mounts to there. Uh, I have no doubt it won't be long before there's a full winch compatible bull bar. I think the Toyota is. Um, Toyota one is a winch compatible bull bar, um, but once I think once a bull bar goes on, it's going to be a, um, a mark improvement on the front end of this car. Uh, so let's roll down underneath it. Stuck with a, um, a ladder frame chassis. So in terms of uh, how they've actually set this up, you've got um, protection plates, so that's a steel plate, good there. Um, there are more plastic plates there, um, but everything is tucked up nice and high. Another plate there, you've got your fuel tank here, which steel plate there, which is good. Um, that must be your sub tank there, which again is good. Um, your exhaust is nice and high and out of the way. Obviously you've got your drive shaft running through here. Again, solid, your knuckle, all looks good. Um, and your uh, rear diff and obviously um, solid rear. Um, you got your, uh, obviously your links, shocks all in there, springs up in there. Um, but looking at it in terms of modification and how we'd actually customize it, it's all easily accessible and it would be easy to work on. So in terms of your, uh, for example, side steps or rock sliders, chassis here, these are your, st your standard steps that come with it. They'll just bolt off, two bolts there, two bolts there, and two bolts there, and that'll come off. Being that your chassis is actually quite uh, low compared to the seal of the car, um, means that it should be really, really easy to throw on um, a set of aftermarket steps or sliders, um, which will give that seal a really, really good amount of protection. Um, and that's a must for any sort of off-roader or, or four-wheel driver. Uh, let's talk aftermarket exhaust. Again, it's that's not gonna be an issue changing that over at all. It's already got a good size diameter exhaust in it. Um, obviously you've got your, uh, your DPF um, and all of your sensors and everything here. So um, legally you're gonna have to go DPF back exhaust, which is cool because pretty much you can just unbolt it from uh, either this point here or that, oh, probably that point there. Um, and you've got easy access to it all the way through which is up over there. It's very, very, very similarly designed to the 200 series, which is good because that worked. And aftermarket fuel tank. So we're asked about whether you're gonna be able to get more fuel capacity in it. We'll go into fuel capacity when we do a bit of a tow test because that's, a, uh, that's a, a big question people are asking. Um, in terms of that, yeah, easy. So uh, more than likely what you'd do is you'd remove the rear wheel, which is in exactly the same spot as the 200 series, remove the rear wheel, um, take that bracket out, you've got a stack of room in there, you're, you're easily gonna get um, probably, I don't know, another 150 um, odd liters up in there uh, without too much issue whatsoever. So that won't be hard to do at all. Then you've got your chassis that runs all the way along the back, which has got obviously your three and a half ton rated uh, tow hitch on the back of it. Um, in terms of mounting a rear bar and whatnot, I can't see that's gonna be any harder than the current model. Uh, you've got easy access to the chassis, chassis mounts. Um, this bar would just pop off. I imagine you're gonna have to do a fair bit of cutting because it's not in two parts. So just like this, the 200 series, you're gonna be cutting, doing a cut all the way around um, to mount that all onto. Um, and, but on the whole, it's a, yeah, I think they've, they've improved on what was already good uh, and made it better. So Jimmy82 has asked, am I gonna be able to get 35s on? Well, that's a good question. Probably two parts to that, because um, we also had someone ask if I'm gonna be able to get 17s on. These are all running 18. I don't know about the 17s. That's, we've got a 17 out there. We'll go and try and um, put it on. If you can get 17s on, it's gonna be bloody tight, but I don't reckon we're gonna be able to.
And while we're here, let's have a look at the stud pattern because most of, or a lot of you would know that a Prado uh, Highlights Ranger all run a six stud pattern. Land Cruisers have always run a five stud pattern. Well, check this out, six studs. So I believe it's a six by 139.7, which is your standard six stud pattern. So if you have nice, nice wheels and tires on your 200 series, you're not gonna be able to carry them over. So new wheels, new tires, uh, new setup. So let's talk wheels and tyres. You've got your standard uh, seven to, uh, 18 inch um, all-terrain tyre, which comes with it. They're a six stud, obviously. Um, same offset uh, as the 200 series. So yeah, there's not much change in regards to that, except for obviously the, um, it's gone to a 265 instead of a 285. This one here is a 315. It is one size smaller than a 35 inch tyre, and it was the only one that we had that was a six stud. Um, so slightly smaller than a 35. Um, uh, and you can see the difference in the size. Uh, both height-wise, you've got obviously a fair bit, but more importantly is actually the width. And why do we harp on about bigger tyres when we're off-roading? It's because a bigger tyre is gonna give you much more traction. When you're out for driving, this you can reduce the tyre pressure of, and it's gonna float better over um, rougher terrains. It obviously makes the engine and the gearbox work a little bit harder, but essentially when you drop the tyre pressures down, bigger tyre means more, um, more traction on the ground. You've got more footprint of the tire on the ground, which gives you, yeah, much better traction overall. This is obviously a mud train tire because it's got the huge lugs on it. Um, it's freaking massive, um, as opposed to this, which is an all-terrain tire. So this is one of your more extreme versions of an off-road tire without going to a full 37. Um, this is the standard tire. If you're gonna be doing a lot of touring, you are definitely gonna swap that out. Um, but as a general runaround, as a, uh, as a camping car, as a family, family hauler, um, nothing wrong with that at all. So let's go and chuck it on and see if we can, um, see if we can get this 17 inch 315 onto a 300 series. I don't think it's gonna fit. It's on. Is it rubbing though? How sick is this? You gotta check this out. We found the first mod you must do to your, uh, your new 300 series when you get a hold of it, bigger wheels and tires. So uh, a little bit involved in putting them on. So basically the Toyota comes with these massive wheel nuts. So um, we've only basically put this uh, three on five on with basically some other wheel nuts, just finger tight. We're not gonna drop it down. We're not driving it or anything. We just wanna see fitment. So, We've gone from a um, positive 60 offset, which is the standard that the Toyota comes with, to zero, um, which means that this is sitting about 60 mil further out than the standard Toyota tire. Uh, so as standard, not gonna cut it. You're gonna be well out of, you know, well out of the wheel arch. Um, uh, however, it doesn't take long and it won't take long for um, all of the aftermarket mob to come up with some good looking flares for this, uh, for this car, which means that you can have a bigger offset for these wheels. And then in terms of clearance, if, ev if you've ever done a bigger wheel or tire changeover for the 200 series, you need to do a fair bit of chopping and, and sort of manipulating to actually make that, um, make that tire fit, which involves chopping basically the body mounts at the back. Well, check this out. In the 300 series, there is nothing back there. You have got that much room behind here, which was your primary issue in the 200 series. Take your mud flap up, uh, mud flap off, and then the back is not going to be an issue at all for bigger wheels and tires. In terms of the front, um, you may have a bit of clearance issues uh, up here, but a lot of this is just plastic trim. Once you get a ball bar on, that's going to adjust all of that angle and what goes in on there. So hopefully, the designers of all the good-looking ball bars. Um, look into that and make sure they make that as part of their build because bigger wheels and tires, I reckon that's the go on the 300. In terms of the design, uh, we're talking about things being uh, big, tough. You've got a big car spindle. Um, as I said, the upper control arms, they look like they've been extended, which gives it a hell of a lot more drop, um, but all easy access to there, nothing unusual. Um, shock will come out easy if you need to get it out. Um, you could be able to pop the, um, uh, pop the upper control arm off if you need to, but yeah, she's solid. Um, you can't be disappointed with that at all. So we do trial fitment at the back. Um, similar story to the front. Looks like it's not going to be an issue, um, uh, but you definitely have to speak to an expert because you're going to need to make sure it doesn't, that it clears all that area there, clears all that area there. It definitely clears everything in here. So in terms of your um, suspension components and your sway bars and all that sort of stuff, heaps of clearance there, um, but you will need a suspension lift. You're probably going to need to do just a little bit of body trimming, um, but on the whole, I reckon she looks pretty schmink. So while we're changing over the tire, we just actually worked this out. And um, this is a bit of a design change. If you look here, the seal of the door 
what's that hoist, is actually protected by, um, by the door. Um, why that's important is the old design basically had um, the body line all running out here and is external. It would get dirty and muddy and whatnot, which meant every time you climbed in and out of the car, if you weren't careful, you'd rub your body up on the door um, and you'd get dirty. With this design, small tweaks, but they make a difference. It's all protected, it'll stay clean, you're not gonna get dirty climbing in and out of the car. The little things count. It's happening here. We wanna see how it looks with the Deluxe 2 built onto it. So, back of the car, Deluxe 2. I reckon, again, looks pretty good. Tailgate test. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, it opens. It's still daft. Impressed with the with the uh, with the droop of the tyres, so we thought we'd do a test. And so pretty much what you do, stick a ramp at the front uh, front one corner, and then a ramp at the rear on the opposite corner, which basically is going to then cause you to um to be lifting up two completely different uh, side wheels. Um, and either the car will get up because it's got a heap of traction from the droop, or the traction control is going to kick in. Um, this surface itself is actually um, it's not very grippy, so that will create a challenge in itself. For all we know, it could actually push the ramps out, but let's um, let's see how it goes. Did not struggle at all. That's a big plus. Yeah, I was just in drive. We had so much fun spending a bit of a day with the uh, with the 300 series that we've actually ended up with enough content and enough footage to make a second part. So what we've done is we've split our video. So we hope you've enjoyed the first part of, uh, of our 300 series test. Make sure you watch the second part where we cover off a bit of a toe test. So we take the uh, 300, uh, take 300 series out with an Iridium. So uh, this bad boy behind us out for a toe test. We cover off the five things I absolutely love about the 300 series and five things I'm not so impressed or hate about the 300 series and do a few other bits and pieces while we've got the car. So make sure you like, subscribe, check out the next part of our video. Um, and yeah, hope you enjoyed watching as much as we enjoyed making it. Thanks.